Now we'll turn our attention to pretrial conferences and orders. There are a lot of cases in federal court, and the backlog for trial is almost unprecedented. As a result, federal district courts have a significant interest in streamlining litigation, simplifying issues, and promoting judicial efficiency. In order to further that interest, a court may require the parties to engage in conferences to organize the litigation. The federal rules provide for pretrial and final pretrial conferences. A court may direct the parties or attorneys to appear before it for a pretrial conference. The pretrial conference may be held for purposes such as expediting the disposition of the action, establishing early and continuing control so that the case won't be protracted because of a lack of management, discouraging wasteful pretrial activities, improving the quality of the trial through more thorough preparation, and facilitating the settlement of the case. The judge possesses discretion in planning and conducting the conference. An attorney must appear at a court-ordered pretrial conference, but the rules don't compel the court to conduct such a conference in every case. It is at the judge's discretion whether to hold a pretrial conference. As a practical matter, however, most judges mandate a pretrial conference in most cases. When a court orders a pretrial conference, at least one of the attorneys for each party participating in the conference must have the authority to enter into stipulations and to make admissions regarding all matters that the participants may reasonably anticipate being discussed. So, for example, it would be inappropriate for a party to only send a junior attorney who hasn't been given any authority to enter into stipulations to a pretrial conference. If appropriate, a court could even require that a party or its representatives be present or reasonably available by telephone in order to consider possible settlement of the dispute. A court could also hold a final pretrial conference. If a court holds a final pretrial conference for a case, the conference must be held as close to the time of trial as reasonable under the circumstances. The participants at a final pretrial conference must formulate a plan for trial, including a program for facilitating the admission of evidence. The conference must be attended by at least one of the attorneys who will conduct the trial for each of the parties and by any unrepresented parties. After any pretrial conference, an order must be entered reciting the action taken as a result of the conference. This order controls the subsequent course of the case, unless it's modified by a subsequent order. The order should only be modified to prevent manifest injustice. A court has wide discretion in dictating the course of the action. The court may issue such orders that are just, and among other options, may impose sanctions on a party or attorney under the following circumstances. 1. If a party or the party's attorney fails to obey a scheduling or pretrial order. 2. If no appearance is made on behalf of a party at a scheduling or pretrial conference. 3. If a party or party's attorney is substantially unprepared to participate in the conference, or 4. If a party or party's attorney fails to participate in good faith. Once again, a court may impose sanctions. 1. If a party or the party's attorney fails to obey a scheduling or pretrial order. 2. If no appearance is made on behalf of a party at a scheduling or pretrial conference. 3. If a party or party's attorney is substantially unprepared to participate in the conference. Or 4. If a party or party's attorney fails to participate in good faith. A judge can also require a party, attorney, or both to pay the reasonable expenses incurred because of any non-compliance. Some other more severe sanctions that a judge may enter include striking a pleading, entering a default judgment, or dismissing a lawsuit. Of course, entering a default judgment or dismissing a lawsuit are extreme sanctions. Generally, they are proper only when a litigant's misconduct is repeated, serious, extreme, or otherwise inexcusable. 
unless a court believes that lesser sanctions wouldn't ensure obedience of the judge's order. Lesser sanctions should be imposed prior to ordering more severe ones. Next, let's briefly address scheduling orders. After receiving the party's discovery reports, a court must enter a scheduling order that limits the time to join other parties and to amend the pleadings, file motions, and complete discovery. The scheduling order may also include modifications of deadlines for required discovery disclosures, the dates for any pretrial conferences and trial, and any other appropriate matter given the circumstances of the case. The order should be issued as soon as practicable. A scheduling order may not be modified except upon a showing of good cause and by leave of the court.